Ladies and gentlemen, look at that visage. Look at that wizened face. Look at that. As years go on, you look more like the sage. Uh, no, I'm talking about the spice, not the uh, wisdom. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, that's uh, Will Durst, ladies and gentlemen. Boys and, and girls, from, hi. Oh, yeah. From San Francisco, California. How you doing, Will? It's all good. It's all good. It's a beautiful Tuesday, foggy, about 55, 57 mm -hmm. degrees right now. And uh, Debbie and I are going to go out for breakfast after this. And uh, that's about it. That's nice. You know, uh, I uh, I hear uh, that uh, you have to walk over the turds, though, in the streets in San Francisco now. Uh, yeah, there seems to be more human feces, but, uh, you know, it's part of the deal. It's a cost of doing business in the city. Yeah, make sure you wear good, solid shoes because you don't want to have a needle go through your foot. Exactly, exactly. It would be so embarrassing. Is it that bad? Work. I've heard it's terrible. Uh, well, you know how people are. They see one piece of human feces and suddenly they're all... Uh, yeah, it's not that bad. It's, uh, you know, uh, I live in the Sunset District. I never see it, okay? Right. So it depends on where you are. There are homeless encampments. Uh, there are some right downtown. Uh, there are some uh, on Polk Street, right off of Polk Street. There are some under the freeway. So, yeah, there are places, and... It's it's a good place to live. So even people who don't have homes, <laughs> it's a good place to live. Even if you don't have a place to live. Yes. Yeah. Oh boy. Yeah. Uh, because a bubble said he was in Chicago last week, and he said I was just amazed by what a clean town Chicago is compared to San Francisco. And you would think that Chicago would be dirty and San Francisco would be clean. Yeah, they have a clever program for the homeless. Uh, they call it winter. <laughs> <laughs> kind of dissuades yeah, them. Yeah, it kind of dissuades also, them. Also, it's also anecdotal. It depends on where you go. He was on the north side. He was at the Vic Theater. And the north side is kind of the yuppie, gentrified side, you yeah. know, of Chicago. Imagine if he went to, you know... Uh, some some play another locale yeah. in Chicago mm -hmm. that it would just be as bad as San Francisco. Now, Maybe not as bad as San Francisco or Santa Monica. Here, Santa. See, that's that's me trying to push uh, <laughs> San Francisco badness off on somebody else. So Santa Monica's bad too. Yeah. Well, let know, me bring so. let me bring this up because Bubs uh, just worked on a movie, and it turns yeah. out you were working on the same movie. Yeah, uh, it was Bubs and me and Lorenzo Lamas. Uh oh, <laughs> he's a really nice guy. Really? He, yeah, he's really down to earth. Yeah, he's not in acting. He only does a couple projects every year. Yeah, he has a real job. He's a helicopter pilot. He runs tourists out to Avalon and Catalina Island. Uh, he just just a really nice guy. It was weird. Wow. That's cool. That yeah, that's cool. Okay. And Bubbles, Bubbles was really good. Yeah, well, he said he only had a couple of lines. But now, here's the... Here, About 15 lines. Yeah. Here's the thing. You played a character called... Gramps. <laughs> How do you feel about that? That you're now... <laughs> the part you're able to get is Gramps. Yeah. Yeah, first movie. Yeah. When you look uh, in the uh, mirror, do you see Gramps? Uh, actually, I do. Yeah, I do now, too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, it's okay. Yeah. yeah. Six and seven. It's part of the deal. Yeah, I was at Costco the other day, and some guy said, I'll be with you in a second, Pops. Pops? Yeah. <laughs> Pops? That, that, that kind of kind of got to me. Effies or yeah. something? Yeah. You run at a drugstore? <laughs> so how many weeks did you have to work on this movie? It was about 10 days. About 10 days. Okay. Yeah. Hey, right, does it look like it'll be a good movie, or is it just... Yeah. Um, I, I think it's too much of a play. I think it was written as a play. Too internal. I haven't... Have, it's it's one of those things where you're inside of it, and you have no idea. Yeah. I, just, I wish it had been taken outside 
the house a couple times. And from what I've read to be, uh, led to believe that they did a scene uh, where people are protesting and that was outside. So hopefully that'll cut it up a little bit. Yeah, that'll but open the it acting, up. The acting was great. The direction was... The guy had a lot of heart, and it was he was a first-time director, and uh, this was uh, his project, and the and the support group. I mean, this was professional in Auburn, you know. It was it was well, just well, you uh, know, you can take Hollywood anywhere, so don't go in Auburn. Yeah, and it was professional for Auburn. No, no, it was it was prof- in Auburn. It was in professional, Auburn. and it was in Auburn, so. Yeah. That's on the way uh, up to Tahoe. The cinematographer was genius. The lighting yeah. guy was genius. You know, it was, it was, and the actors, the other actors were really, really good. It was, we, uh, he hooked into the Sacramento Mafia. Yeah. There's a group of Sacramento actors and they have an acting teacher and, yeah. and they're, they're, they all know each, yeah. Wow, that's terrific. Well, it sounds uh, like you had a good time. Auburn, that's on the way to Tahoe. And this happened today. Yeah. Oh, is changing. So what's new? What's that? What paper is that in? Uh, San Francisco Chronicle. It's my column. It debut, debuted today. Oh, really? I got a bi-weekly column, but the easy way, because bi-weekly can mean twice a week or once every two weeks, and I'm once every two weeks, so I'm writing a column for the Chronicle. They pay- debuted today. Are they paying you decent money? No. No. <laughs> Why do you think? Why do you think journalism? The state of journalism is such as it is today. Yeah. Wait a minute. Hold that up again. What's the? What's your? What's your headline today? Um, it is yep. San Francisco is changing. So what's new? Okay. Well, that's you know. Yeah. That's that's my conceit. That, you know, it that, always changes. San Francisco is the petri dish of social change. Oh. Okay. All right. And it's supposed to be funny. It's like a Q&A. It's like frequently asked questions. You ever see that? Yeah, right. In a newspaper, that's what. No, okay. So, and how many words is it? About seven, 700. Oh, seven. I thought you meant seven words. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see Really well-spaced. What, really well-spaced, yeah. yeah okay, so that's, well, 700. Uh, that's that's a movie and a column. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's good. I know. Gee, your career's going somewhere. Yeah, good timing, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's one o'clock your time. Uh, anyway, uh, somebody died that we I know we respected, and uh, no. yeah, Paul Krasner, eighty-seven, eighty-seven years old. I, I, you know what? I feel guilty about. I haven't talked to him in years. I feel guilty about that. It would have been nice had I talked to him a little bit in the last couple of years. You know, Paul Krasner, in case people don't know, was the publisher and editor of The Realist, a magazine that came out that was, how, how can we describe it? Uh, well, he was writing for Mad Magazine at the time, mm-hmm. and, he, and he decided that this was like in the early 60s, and he decided that there needed to be a Mad Magazine for adults instead of teenagers and that's what the realist was and it was satire really that's that's simple yeah yeah Uh, i didn't know it started that way uh but um i do know that he had at one point financial problems keeping it open and and i bankrolled him really yeah to keep it open keep it going he said i need like i don't know couple thousand bucks something like that and i said no problem i had the money at the time and i had gary write him a check and he got it back to me by the way no shit. got it back to me uh but uh i kind of felt proud of that you know being able to bail out the the realist the realist yeah yeah so yeah well, I, you, you you were uh you helped with midnight blue which was kind of like the video version of of the realist. Nah, not really. Not really. It was a video version of me trying to get my nut off. <laughs> What's wrong with <laughs> <You know? laughs> But Krasner, I mean, he edited uh, Lenny's autobiography, How mm-hmm. to Talk Dirty and Influence People. That's right. And um, you I don't know what 
title was based, uh, people these days don't get the title, but it was based on the whole Dale Carnegie thing, you know, right. how to influence people. and Right. Success. And he uh, also, um, uh, and people forget this, I don't think I saw this in any of the uh, obituaries, he was the editor for about a year of Hustler magazine. That's right, Larry Flint. Yeah. 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 So, you know, I mean, it... Uh, uh, that was, I think it was at the time when Larry wanted to turn it into a religious publication. Do you remember that? No. Yeah. No. And everybody. Did you know Larry Flint? Uh, yeah, I've known Larry over the years. You know. Uh, Pre chair or post chair? Well, post, oh, uh, uh, both. Both. Uh, I knew him, the first time I ever met him was at uh, Screw Magazine years ago when we did. Uh, Goldstein did an interview with him for Midnight Blue. Oh, wow. Yeah. And uh, as the years went on, uh, I would bump into him. And my, uh, the guy who started Midnight Blue with me, Bruce David, became his, uh, his editor for Hustler for years. And that's how I started writing for Hustler. I had a column every month for about six years. Oh, no shit. Yeah, yeah. Wrote what was it on? Anything I wanted to. It wasn't didn't have to be sex or anything like monthly? that. Huh? Monthly? Uh, monthly, yeah. Oh. Yeah, there were three columnists. Um, I'm trying to remember who the other two were. They, if I mentioned their names, you'd know exactly who they were. And um, uh, it was uh, it was 1,200 words, I think, per column. Gee. And... Um, you pay you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, in the beginning, got paid pretty well, actually. I used to make uh, a dollar a word. Fuck it, eh? Yeah, yeah. Then they lowered it down to like three hundred a column. You know, when when things weren't going good. Uh, yeah. Uh, that uh, yeah, but um, uh, uh, it was uh, it, you know it's pretty good all the way around. You know, and uh, I I wrote on any number of things. I mean, everything from uh, very few things on sex. They were basically cultural or whatever. Um, well, that's what the the redeeming feature of that magazine was. And then I also wrote uh, articles for them. I, I wrote a whole 3,000-word uh, column, uh, column or, or article about the death of Air America. Uh, oh. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I, I, I was doing some very significant writing for them for years. That was... The death of Air America. When was that? Like two thousand six, something like that. Six well, seven. It was recent. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I did all. I stopped. Yeah, right. I think it was like two thousand seven, two thousand eight. Yeah. 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 But so I mean, I, was, I have all the columns here that I wrote. Uh, twelve they were, years ago. Huh? That was like twelve years ago. Yeah. I remember you took me up to the offices of uh, of Al Goldstein. Screw and Magazine. Took me to Screw Magazine. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that was a dump. It was. Yeah, that's all I remember. Just, uh, uh, but magazines and newspapers all around, and you know the way you, the way you would think that a New York magazine, that you know an underground magazine would look like. Well, was, publishers, publishers, and and people who ran magazines never had much uh, care for the surroundings they worked in. Uh, and uh, so most of these places, I'm sure if you went to Mad Magazine, it was a dump too, you know, in the early years. So uh, that's just the way things go. But, uh, you know, having to do a column every month made me into a writer, you know. Uh, um, and I, I'm, yeah, you know. What? Yeah, it's always hanging over your head, that deadline, man. Oh, I, you know, I would sit there and I'd go, oh, hey, it's due in three days. Oh, God. And then I would just sit down here and just do it, you know. Uh, but I'm still in high school. If it's due Monday morning, I don't start it till after the Sullivan show. Yeah, well, I mean, part of the reason for that is your best inspiration comes out of desperation. <laughs> You know, and that desperation of I got to get this done, I got to get this done is, um, you know. Necessity is the mother of invention. Absolutely. Absolutely. But, um, yeah, I mean, I wrote um, on everything. My favorite column that I wrote, oddly enough, was one titled Who Killed Uncle Remus? 
uh, about Song of the South, Disney's film, and how it had been not seen in this country in years, and that it was really a, a sad thing. And I t told the history behind it and why it wasn't racist and why uh, they should release it here in America so people can see it because it was a wonderful picture. And the performance by, uh, I think his name was James Baskett, was his name, or Bassett, uh, as, as Uncle Remus, is one of the two or four performances in film, and he, he got, even got an honorary Academy Award for it. Uh, what ha what happened? Uh, people just figured. And double ACP came along and said, "This is racist," and so they did away with it. You know, the only thing you ever saw of it was maybe a clip of uh, Bassett singing uh, uh, "Zippity Doo Dah." Uh, oh, that's from. Oh. Yeah, that won the Academy Award for best song that year. Yeah. You know. Uh, but it's a it's a nice little film, and I often felt it was a shame that it had been just, bleh, you know, killed. So, oh, anyway. where can you see it? Uh, how about Japan? You know, you can go online and find a copy of it. I bet you YouTube, yeah. Yeah, you you can find copies of it, but it was it's not sold in America. To this day, it's not sold in America. And, and Disney keeps saying, well, we're constantly rethinking it and rethinking it. And there was nothing racist about it, you know. They didn't like the, the you know, this about Br'er Rabbit. And uh, uh, one of the episodes is how he does, uh, how, he, how he outwits the fox and the bear by making a tar baby. And then they tried to go after the tar baby and got snared in the tar. And tar baby has always been this term people have used for black people. And uh, they found that racist. Well, it wasn't racist at all, you know. He yeah. outsmarted him. He outsmarted him, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and um, uh, it, it's just, uh, you know, it, uh, anyway, that was one of my favorite articles. So, I, you know, so far out of field, that, you know. But every month I got to just rant about stuff, and it uh, for it, six years, huh? For six years. For six years, yeah, yeah. Might have been longer than that. I don't know, but I think it was six years. Wow. By the time they finally killed the column, uh, I had, uh, uh, you know, I, I I had done about six years. I think I'm I'm trying to remember how long it was exactly, but I have all the columns here. They're like. Well, per year for six years, okay? It's a lot of, a lot of writing. And I, I have the rights to them, so I was thinking years ago of doing a book out of it. But I'm lazy. What can I say? You know, I'm just lazy. You think well, more... You, you care more... You're a renaissance man. You, well, you care more about your writing than I care about mine, you know? So, uh, anyway, what do you think about the world around us? Well, everybody's... Uh spending so much time chronicling the horse race uh, on uh, MSNBC and CNN. They're so worried about who's leading the polls now. It's, a, it's over a year away. It doesn't matter who's leading the polls. And I don't know why they're so focused on it. I really yeah. don't know. Well, I mean, it, it, it's ridiculous because who's ever in the lead now might be in the back, you know, six months from now. You don't know how things are going to go. No, and they're spending all this time on it rather than focusing on what uh, the uh, the Oompa, Oval Office Oompa Loompa is doing, which is like lying and cheating and stealing. Although tomorrow will be interesting to see if Mueller yeah. uh, says anything yeah. that we haven't heard. Well, I think he maybe keep his cards close to his vest, but at least they can kind of like corner him and say okay what did you mean by that doesn't mean that he's innocent it just means i'm not making a, a judgment here uh and he's gonna ha kind of have to give that some edification you know so but the justice department supposedly told him not to talk about anything uh that wasn't in the report not to talk about conclusions not to talk about uh, any uh, uh, revelations about the anybody who wasn't charged? Mm -hmm. uh, he can't talk about anything that might have to do with executive privilege. I mean, it's all the things the Justice Department told him he didn't, he couldn't talk about. So they kind of neutered him 
Well, is executive privilege hiding facts? You know, uh, and keeping yeah, facts. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's all lawyers speak. Yeah. I don't know what they can do to him. What if he does, you know, what if he says, well, there was a time that Trump met with the guy that we found out, but we didn't tell anybody, yeah. and now I'm telling you for the first time. And what's the Justice Department going to do? Are they going to put uh, Mueller in jail? He just doesn't seem to have the type of personality where he's going to buck the system, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Plus, I mean, um, I, I just, I. I just think that the Democrats should play this game by not going after Trump, but by making their case of how they can make things better and talk about bringing back to this country a certain civility that it is lacking at this moment, you know, and appealing to them that way. I think that may play, but I think going after Trump constantly is kind of boring. I can't even watch MSNBC anymore. Yeah. I mean, it's so boring because I know where they're going to fall on any particular subject. Nobody ever surprises me. Yeah, and and I I think I don't know about you, but I would I would love I love to go get news from people who are going to give me um, uh, uh, an open-minded view of what's going on and not just spend the whole time saying, oh, well, we got Trump today. Boy, we got him on this and we got him on that. You know, I think that's a complete waste of time. I think a better part of uh, spending their time in the news business is to just simply report what's going on. You know, I, I found myself watching uh, CBSN. Are you familiar with CBSN? Mm -hmm. CBSN is a news app. And they do constant 24-7 broadcasting on the app. And they're kind of like, they're reporting everything, okay, including foreign news and what's happening in foreign countries. And when it comes to Trump saying something, they simply reported what he said. They don't sit around parsing it saying, oh, isn't this horrible what he said? Oh, that's horrible. They just report it. And I, I find that refreshing. You know, so I find myself going on the app and watching CBSN more and more often. You know, what do you use as your news source? Anything? Uh, well, I'm exactly um, in line with you. I, I watch MSNBC, and I then I can't watch it anymore. I can't watch it. Yeah. And then I can't not watch it. So I go through these phases. I, I watch it. I can't watch it. I can't not watch it. I, 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 I shut off from everything. I try to go fishing, but then I hate fishing, so uh, I, I purge myself. I have I have a fast, a media fast, and I listen to music, but I yeah. hate music, so I go back to sports, and then all they talk about is the same thing on sports. It's like one issue. Yeah. And so that I go back to um, CNN. I try CNN. And there's the exacts, yeah. Yeah, but nevertheless, you have to watch these people because you have to know what's going on because that's your business. Well, yeah, I need to, I need to, the, you know, let me know what's, yeah. To, yeah. To, oh, I'll, you know, write, yeah. Yeah. Right. That, do you, you, what newspapers do you read? You read The Chronicle in San Francisco. Right? I'll read The Chronicle. Um I read the uh, National Edition of the New York Times. Yeah, yeah. Debbie gets the Wall Street Journal. That's I look at that sometimes. It's good, good paper. It's a good paper, yeah. Uh, and uh, then I do the web stuff. Uh, you know, I'll read USA Today if I'm at a hotel. Yeah. Because uh, <laughs> I give it away free. I'm not paying two bucks for that. Uh, and I'll pick up you know, all the freebies, uh, SF Weekly and the Bohemian and, you know, all anything. I'll read anything. And so what do you find gives you the most information for your act? Oh, I don't know. It's osmosis. It's just, I just sit there and I let everything kind of yeah. sink in. Because I'm listening for buzzwords and I'm listening for, you know, isolated phrases that I could put into... Uh, either the syndicated column or or the because you know it's two different voices when you write a column as when you do stand up. Yeah. Uh, so you can only take one or two lines and put it in the stand up. 
Uh, so I'm I'm just listen I'm I'm just absorbing everything, and then yeah. I'm uh, regurgitating uh, the stuff that works. Well, you know, I mean, and you now have that even more wizened look as the years go on. So you look like the sage of political commentary. Yeah, I'm going for the uh, Mr. Miyagi. Now, look. All, all you need at that age now is an enlarged prostate, and you'll be fine. <laughs> I got something. I don't know what I got, but I got something. Yeah. Well, do you have to pee right now? I do. Oh, well, then you probably have an enlarged prostate. <laughs> I always thought that was God's little joke, you know, the prostate. Uh, you know, I mean, because it's like this donut-shaped uh, thing, and then the urethra goes right through it. And then as you age, it enlarges and presses down on the urethra so you have a hard time peeing. Now... Uh. What didn't God say? Hmm, maybe I should move that over to the side. <laughs> so there is no God, right? Because God he in this just saving space. He was saving space was, for the important. <laughs> that was one of the worst engineered things ever, <laughs> ever. You know. Hey, listen, we've run out of time already. Oh no, not already. Uh, nice to finish on prostates. <laughs> Next time I'll try to do urethras. Yeah, yeah. Are you playing anywhere that uh, maybe some uh, people? Saturday, yeah. Come out to uh, Livermore, the Rets Laugh uh, uh, Vineyards. Uh, it's a lot of fun. It's always a What's it called? Event. What's it called? The Ret Rets Laugh in Livermore. And Deb and Mike are opening, and some guy named Mean Dave is uh, the MC. So it's going to be a lot of fun. You're good. Saturday night. Good, because we have a lot of people in the San Francisco Bay Area who watch this. So. Oh, cool. Yeah, come out to Livermore. Nobody else, but, uh, or, you know, anyway. Or, or look for my column every two weeks in the, in the, I, I in, lost in, it. In yeah. the San Francisco but, Chronicle, Chronicle, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, yeah. First, every two weeks. It's first one is today, weeks. right? First one, it de debuts today. Okay, and so. It's on SF Gates if you want to look it up. Ladies and gentlemen, he's lovely, he's wonderful, he's Will Durst. Thanks, Will. Thanks, thanks for going uh, going through with me all my problems here with the technical things. Well, we had some technical problems at the beginning. You're a genius. See you later, Will. <laughs>